Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is Thursday, the 7th of May. We are in week six of lockdown here in the UK, and we're all looking forward, I'm sure, to this Sunday hearing something about how restrictions might start to be lifted in one form or another. We can't wait, I'm sure. I hope you guys have all been safe and well and have been enjoying the return of the sunshine a little bit, at least, to be able to get outside as we can. So, this is a packed Q&A uh, this Thursday. We've got an awful lot uh, to get through. First off, it's prize week. So as many of you know, what we do every month or so is we look back over the questions that uh, I've managed to answer over the Q&As over the previous month. Um, and I then look back and reflect and think, what was the question that really got me? What was the one that really kind of went, oh yeah, that is an amazing question. And that person wins a prize. Well, we have been going at it with the questions this week. We have been getting through well over three pages worth of questions. Hello, Rosie. Hello, Annette. Hello, Linda. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much indeed for joining in. And just to remind you, some of the amazing things we've been talking about. So we've talked about uh, Greek people's greatest heroes. We've talked about how did the ancients wipe their bottoms, uh, thanks to the lack of, of toilet paper. Uh, we've thought about how do you celebrate birthdays in antiquity, also anniversaries, also the 1st of April with April Fools. Um, we thought about traveling in ancient Rome. We thought about the worship of the gods. We thought about ancient oracles talked about plagues. Uh, we, of course, had the fantastic question from Jeremy Davis asking about Greek theatre production. We've had the World Cup of ancient Greek plays as a result. Um, we've talked about ancient sayings and how they've come through into the modern day, like getting the wrong end of the stick or in Rome do as the Romans do. Uh, we've talked about the Antonine Wall. We've talked about how far do the Romans get into Wales. We've talked about Themistocles and the Battle of Salamis. And of course, then we've had our fantastic If I Was. Thanks very much, Linda, for these brilliant questions. If I was Han Solo, who would be my Chewbacca? If you could stop an impending disaster by warning somebody, who would it be? Or what would it be? And what was a piece of art, ancient or modern, that blew you away? So these have been amazing questions that over the past couple of weeks. We have traversed uh, antiquity and brought it into modernity all at the same time. But there can only be one winner, and it is with great pleasure to announce that our 19th prize winner, so the 19th prize winner in these live Q&As that have been going on since we started back in summer 2018, goes to Ginny Teodoro Gillian for her question, was Leonidas a young man or an old man? A simple question, but one that I absolutely knocked me for six because I'd never even considered it before, despite the main, 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 main role Leonidas played in such a famous part of Greek history. So congratulations to Ginny. You win either a copy of my book, Ancient Worlds, or if you prefer, a copy of my book, Life in Ancient Greece, specifically for Key Stage 2, Key Stage 3 work. So let us know. Get in touch via the Facebook page. Get in touch via email, Michael Scott academic at gmail.com Ginny and let us know um, which you would prefer congratulations to you but congratulations to everyone for such a fantastic roundup of questions now before we get on to this week's questions I could not resist um, but go through some of the things that you guys have been coming up with on the Facebook page in response uh, to Linda's question about what historical figure would you warn to try and avert an impending disaster uh, and from Catherine Ancy what piece of ancient art or modern art blew you away because your answers have been spectacular. Um, I've been enjoying about what historical figures or places would you warn. I think my particular favourite that's um, come out is that people would insist on a sprinkler system being installed in the Library of Alexandria to stop it burning down and stop us uh, losing that great wealth of knowledge that we did with the burning down of that library. Absolutely brilliant idea. And I don't know if I mentioned this to you before, but I was amazed to find out uh, a month or two ago that um, Amazon's Alexa the kind of the font of all knowledge now in so many households. Uh, the Alexa is named the Alexa after the Library of Alexandria. So there we go. It might have burned down. It might not have had a sprinkler system, but if only now it had had an Amazon, Amazon Alexa instead to help us out. Um, Pandora also featured on the online page. Don't open the box, whatever you do. Brilliant. Um, and also uh, Pliny the Elder. Uh, I know it might sound very interesting and exciting to get in your boat and row over towards that exploding volcano over there to see what's going on, but don't. 
Um, and I think that's, that's very wise advice, right? Don't go rowing into uh, the midst of obvious danger. Um, I think that is a particularly good piece of advice. Um, and then in response to Catherine's question, what piece of ancient Ornandy modern art blew you away? We've had some great uh, suggestions. The Cup of Nestor, which you were able to see in the British Museum in the recent Troy exhibition. Uh, the Nike of Samothrace that's in the Louvre, absolutely fantastic. And particularly if you watch Beyonce's video of her dancing around in the Louvre at night around the Nike of Samothrace, makes that piece of art even more unforgettable. Um, the mask of, uh, death mask of uh, King Tut of Tutankhamun, that came in uh, as well. The Boxer at Rest, I think this is a great sculpture, a really, really important early Hellenistic um, sculpture of a boxer who is tired, defeated with his face bloodied and bruised and he's looking up in the sky going oh god not again not again that moment where um, sculpture is not just about people at heroes at the tops of their game but actually at people um kind of in those moments of vulnerability uh, as well which i think is a brilliant one uh, wall painting from livia's garden absolutely uh, the assyrian release in the british museum and indeed as a, as a big location people were really blown away as to when you approach the treasury of Petra coming at it through the rock. Some amazing ideas and suggestions there. Um, thank you very much indeed. Did anyone mention Icarus? He needed a warning. Thanks for that, Lyndon. Then no, 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 he didn't. I don't think anyone did mention Icarus, but you're absolutely right. He definitely needs a warning label. It's one of those occasions where on the on the feathers, on the wings, there should have been a warning label, you know, do not expose to uh, small children or to extreme heat don't wash above 40 degrees, that kind of thing. Um, so absolutely brilliant questions. And then finally, of course, we had over the uh, course of the week, weekend and week, we had the World Cup of Ancient Greek Plays. So this was brilliant, um, all thanks to Jeremy Davies. Uh, and we had some winners. So from the uh, kind of direct competition for a single winner, we had Oedipus Rex that came out as your favorite tragedy, followed very, very closely by Trojan women. So it was 80% votes going for uh, kind of Oedipus Rex or kind of it, it, it got 80% of the votes and then, and then just 2% behind came in Trojan women. And then we ran, ran, ran it as pairs, so comedy and tragedy pairs. Um, and out of that, the winner was Frogs and uh, the Bacchae. So uh, Aristophanes' Frogs and Euripides' Bacchae, two plays about Dionysus. Um, and just pipping the post uh, of Thesmothorified Zeusite and Trojan women. Now, the exciting thing is, as you may have seen on the Facebook page, that Jeremy Davies has not, not only thanked us for our suggestions and our thoughts of this competition, but indeed agreed to take forward our winner of the pair of Frogs and Backy and put that on as his choice of plays uh, next year. Uh, so we'll kind of, we have directly influenced what's going on the main stage um, and we wish him all the very best with the staging of that production, with all the difficulties of social distancing, etc, etc, in our post-COVID-19 uh, world that I'm sure will be there. So we, uh, he, Jeremy's going to keep us abreast of all of those um, arrangements and when the play goes on I suggest we all get in the cars or uh, any, any kind of transport and get down there uh, to uh, watch the production. Now coming out of that and coming out of also uh, the decision to um, do the reading of Poseidon from the beginning of Trojan Women for the actors of Dionysus Daily Dose, some of you were suggesting about reading some more um, excerpts, some more uh, speeches from ancient drama or indeed some ancient poems. Poetry. Um, and we want to set this up now as the next uh, competition on the Facebook page. So uh, kind of can you come up with your favourite uh, speeches, your favourite moments from ancient drama that uh, we can then run a competition around and the top five um, I will do my very best to put into dramatic life with some narrations um, that will go out live and we might well be doing these not on Facebook, we'll do these uh, on YouTube and do these as, as part of YouTube live um, kind of exciting uh, extravaganzas. So uh, I asked Jeremy because I thought Jeremy would have a brilliant view on some of his favourite pieces as well. And he's very kindly come back and made some suggestions. So I'm going to give uh, some of his suggestions out now to get you guys thinking. But what I'd really love is over the course of uh, this uh, end of this week and this weekend, if you can, to the Facebook page, suggest your favourite speeches. You don't have to copy and paste the whole speech. Just give us a sense of where they are and a couple of lines maybe from it and we can find the whole thing then we'll whittle that down to a final list and we'll post those speeches in their entirety so that you can have a good read through them and then vote on your favorites so um what did jeremy have in mind so first off he went to antigone 
uh, Sophocles is Antigone, uh, and he uh, earmarked the speech not by Antigone, interestingly enough, but actually by the son of the king. So the king is Creon, the son Hymon, and it's where the son talks to his father, trying to get him to see sense and to listen to reason and not be the unmovable, unbreakable ruler. Um, so that's an absolutely brilliant speech. Um, for Jeremy, it's about the pathos of the son pleading with his father um, that really felt very personal. Patrick's already come up with a suggestion. Pericles' funeral oration. Absolutely. Let's put that on the list. Infamy, infamy. They've all got it in for me from Nicola for Carry On fans. Oh God, I love Carry On films so much. Yes, absolutely. Um, kind of the... Uh, uh, your husband, uh, Linda, suggested the messenger speech from the backy. Absolutely. Let's add that to the list as well. Brilliant. Um, then Jeremy came up with, from Euripides, Hippolytus, which I think is a lesser known play, but absolutely brilliant. Uh, when Hippolytus talks to the nurse. Now, this one, he ad freely admits, is an example of sheer hubris uh, because it's a speech in which Hippolytus starts like this. Oh, Zeus, why did you allow women to live in the light of the sun, yet let someone teach them to control their desires or leave me to trample them underfoot forever? Now, that does need some contextualization because Hippolytus is having a very, very difficult time of it um, in that he is being pursued by a woman who once has he spurned her advances, she is now lying about him to his father uh, and as a result getting him into a huge amount of trouble and potentially into a life and death struggle with his father. So, uh, you know, the, the women are causing some trouble for Hippolytus when he makes this speech. Um, Medea, Euripides Medea, uh, absolute brilliant one, Medea speaking to her children, uh, saying, children, children, now you have a city and passion is the cause of all life's greatest horrors, just before, of course, she goes on to murder them as a way of getting back at her cheating husband. So an absolutely great speech there. Hit Jeremy's all-time favourite, Euripides at his absolute best. Um, Daniel Williams is suggesting Socrates' apology. Uh, kind of absolutely brilliant. Yes, we could get that in. Um, kind of uh, let's have that on the list as well. Um, uh, Oedipus Tyrannus, so Oedipus Rex, second episode, Jocasta talking to Oedipus, saying, free yourself now of these things. Uh, whatever the gods need to track down, he'll easily reveal himself. And of course, setting up the fact uh, that everything is about to change for poor old Oedipus. Oh well. And then finally, we've got from Aeschylus's Agamemnon, the third uh, episode when Agamemnon makes his great entrance, returning to the city after his time away at Troy. Firstly, it's right and proper that I should greet Argos and all the goth gods who inhabit this land. Um, we in the audience all know what is going to happen to Agamemnon. He's not going to have a very good time of it, but he has absolutely no idea as yet. Um, Annette Oliver talks about the Ajax soliloquy before he commits suicide. Absolutely. Priam begging Achilles for Hector's body back. Great idea, Alexis. Um, no Monty Python fans. Nicola, oh, there must be some Monty Python fans here. I'm absolutely sure uh, kind of there'll be some Monty Python fans. Uh, he's not the Messiah. He's just a very naughty boy. There we go uh, for you, uh, uh, Nicola. Right. So um, get your thinking caps on. Send in your suggestions of the best uh, speeches, the things that really move you most, the pieces that really move you most from ancient drama, from ancient literature, from ancient comedy as well. I'm thinking about a particular speech where Demos, uh, the old decrepit figure of democracy, sort of throws off his uh, old clothes and shows that he's still a match for even the most uh, cunning person trying to uh, waylay and mislead him. Um, kind of, uh, so that's another possible option. Or indeed your favourite poetry, ancient poetry as well, or indeed your law court speeches that you might really like. A bit of Lysias against Eratosthenes goes a long way. So uh, that's going to come up and we'll uh, sort out the uh, uh, competition for running next week. So thank you all so much. So much great stuff going on. You guys are being so inventive, so incredible through the Facebook page. I can't thank you enough for your time and effort that you're putting in. Brilliant. Um, we've definitely, there you go, Samantha, I'm a Monty, Pon Monty Python fan. Angela Ryder, how many Romans? There we go. You've got it all now, Nicola. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so on that note, in terms of Monty Python and ancient Rome, some new questions that have come in this week. Uh, and we've had one from Charlotte Wagg, who uh, talks about her daughter is learning about ancient Rome times. So 
Uh, this is a really interesting question. Oh, I think we just had a bit of a problem with the Wi-Fi, but hopefully we're back up and live now again. Um, so interesting, interesting. How were criminals tried during Roman times? So I'm taking this to mean, Charlotte, that your daughter's interested actually in the legal process of deciding on their guilt, how were they tried, rather than necessarily the punishment um, that would come over. Um, so uh, kind of in terms of trials, kind of what we know about ancient Rome is that it was, it was very much up to you, if you'd been aggrieved, to go forward into a public place where the, uh, the person who'd aggrieved you, so uh, you were the plaintiff, they were the defendant, was, and in public, in front of everyone, you needed to uh, call them out on it and say, look, I think you've done me this wrong, and I think you should give me this recompense. Um, and you know, if, if the other person agreed right there and then, fine, that was all said and done. But if not, then you could drag them, uh, quite literally in some cases, to court um, and then there would be a, a setup for a sort of a trial which would be divided into two parts. There would be a preliminary hearing where it would be very, very formulaic, but basically deciding whether or not there was a case to answer. Uh, if there was a case to answer, then a, a judex, a kind of judge, would be appointed, not necessarily a specialist in any form, uh, sometimes just you know another citizen, a Roman citizen, and then you would be putting forward your arguments. So this is not a world in which there are necessarily lawyers, uh, kind of, there might be speech writers hanging behind the scenes, but not necessarily lawyers. Um, you had to get up and give your speech and you would be able to call witnesses, you'd be able to uh, refer to legal documents or to the laws, um, uh, etc. And you would make your case and there would then be a judgment. But that judgment came with a decision which didn't necessarily then have um, an enforceability. So hopefully at that point, the defendant would go, all right, fair cop, you've got me, uh, I will do X or Y, whatever the, the punishment was. Um, but if they didn't, then it would have to be passed on to a magistrate, an actual official, a sort of legal official, who would then be able to enforce what had been decided. Sarah Scotty, there have been several people in my life whom I'd have loved to actually drag to court. Yes, this sort of dragging to court thing, or indeed in the ancient Greek world, dragging somebody out of court uh, was quite a uh, famous thing. Francesca's, sorry to dive out, had really bad Wi-Fi problems and it keeps freezing. Oh no, I'm very, very sorry. I hope it's not uh, at our end as much as ever. Francesca, also, can we just say before you go, absolutely fantastic online resources you are creating in conjunction with Classics for All and uh, the Warwick Classics net Network related to the GCSE and A-level syllabuses. Absolutely brilliant, loving the videos on uh, ancient uh, Greek religion. Keep it up, absolutely fab. Um, so uh, Charlotte, for your daughter there, you've got some sense uh, idea of the trial. In some ways, not that different from the way that our system works today, apart from obviously ours having a whole series more legal professionals who take over. Um, but in terms of punishments, well, what what was the punishment side of things? Well, uh, very often fines, uh, kind of that would be the sort of thing, that, particularly if it was between Roman citizen and Roman citizen, uh, be fines, could be some jail time, there could be some jail time, um, but then depending on who, if you weren't uh, a Roman citizen, if you were a foreigner or if you were a slave, then a whole series of other things started to come on the table and that could be uh, flogging, it could be being put to death and it could be of course famously for non-Romans it could be uh, being put to death in the most um, kind of unedifying and undistinguished manner possible the method that the Romans thought really did the most indignity to you which was of course crucifixion uh, so kind of there was an awful really wide scale of punishments um, that were on the table if you ended up being found guilty uh, so, Charlotte, thank your daughter so much indeed for that question. Um, Karen, uh, we're now here we go. We've got another question to put on the Facebook page here from Karen Pitt Bibby. If you could take one item home from any museum, what would you take? So not so much about what a piece of ancient or modern art or architecture or artwork has, has sort of spoken to you and in, 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 in the most, um, but what piece of, uh, from any museum would you take home? Now, of course, I do not endorse in any, any manner uh, the idea of stealing from museums, so let's put that to one side, but in an ideal world. If you could take home a piece from a museum, what would it be? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much indeed for your participation. Hello, Patricia. Hello, Isabel. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm glad that you're so grateful also for Francesca's resources. They're absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah, so what would be the thing you would take home from a museum? 
So I was thinking about this, and I'd love you guys to think about this as well. Let us know now uh, while we're live, or indeed over the Facebook page, and we'll put up a, a post about this to ask the question. Uh, and I was thinking, actually, the two of the things that I would really love, if one was allowed to do this, uh, would be from uh, a little-known museum, the Museum of Thebes. In Greece. Now, uh, not many tourists go to Thebes, although I heartily recommend it. I remember once reading in a tour guide book of Greece, I think it was a rough guide to Greece, on the page about Thebes, it said Thebes is only for the hardened traveller. Um, and I don't think that's the case at all. I think you should get to Thebes if you possibly can. Absolutely brilliant part of Greece. Um, and they have an amazing now brand new museum that's uh, just been opened after many, many years definitely worth going to once we're out of COVID-19. But I saw it when it was in its previous formulation, when it really was a museum where stuff was just stacked up all over the place. But um, some amazing, amazing things. And two things stick in my mind. One was a tiny little terracotta model, uh, which I often show my students in the first year of their courses in classics, because I, I think it completely turns on your head the idea of what ancient art was really about. It's a terracotta model, not made particularly well, painted, and some bright colours, but clearly not a, an expensive object, something to have around the house that tickled somebody's fancy in antiquity. And it is of a man sitting down grating cheese over a cheese grater. Now, who knew that they had cheese graters in antiquity, but even more so, who knew that it was worth, somebody thought it was worth making a small terracotta statue of this cheese grating man in antiquity and selling it and somebody bought it and it survived amazingly enough to now be in the museum uh, in Thebes. So kind of, I absolutely love that object and would uh, love it or love to have a copy of it uh, on my desk as well. Uh, and then also from that Thebes museum, there are uh, grave steely, grave stones, now, we're used to seeing these in lots of different Greek cities, but these ones in Thebes are absolutely extraordinary because they actually retain some of the original colouring and paint on the gravestone that was applied. Um, and as a result, they are full of life and splendour and vivacity. And you can imagine seeing um, in the, uh, the cemetery, ancient cemetery of Thebes, which would have been just outside the city walls, um, that you, this, this forest of colour, not of, of white or black, because we kind of imagine uh, these places being today, but actually a forest of colour and of life uh, and of action. Uh, and this was absolutely brilliant to see as well. So Isabel says, you love the tiny little ancient Egyptian statues. You'd like some of those. Linda wants King Tut's death mask. Yeah, oh, God, dear, you don't ask much, do you, Linda? Uh, kind of, so do please respond to Karen Vivi's question about what uh, item, if you could take it home from any museum, what would you take? And if you can, send us a picture of the object as well um, so that we've got a great idea. Uh, time is a flying. So I want to take a quick break um, to share some amazing news with you. And when we'll go back to answer a question or two before we finish. Yes. You may have been wondering if you saw on Twitter or Instagram earlier on a short little picture, which I shamelessly took from one of the fantastic Facebook followers who brought it into the Facebook page. Um, thank you so much for sharing it. It was Hercules on a roll with Bless My Soul written above. And as we all know, I'm a massive fan of Disney's Hercules. Bless my soul, Herc was on a roll. How's it go? Top of every Greek opinion poll? Something like that. Um, and it has now been announced that they are going to make a live action Hercules film based on uh, the kind of Disney's Hercules. Now, this is probably the best news that's, that's come out in, in, in the last months, if not years, in my professional opinion. Uh, but Walt Disney Studios have teamed up with those that uh, remade The Lion King um, and others to create this film. And it's going to be a, a theatrical release and it's expected to feature songs from the original animated film with new ones also being added. So we can only hope the Bless My Soul Hercules was on a roll is going to be in there uh, as part of it but fingers crossed and when it comes out we are all off on a massive mass visit uh, socially distanced still perhaps uh, to go and see this incredible uh, place am i fancying the role says jonathan hargreaves would i like to be hercules oh, oh. disney's hercules i would i grew up uh, loving disney's hercules would have done anything to be disney's hercules i don't think i would really like to be hercules in real life that's for sure i think he's a, a meaner man um i gave a lecture about hercules uh, as part of our warwick classics network event uh, last november that you can check out through the youtube channel um 
if you like. And when you get into the story of Hercules, he's not actually that much of a pleasant character. So I will say, of course, the Disney version does kind of whitewash him a bit and make him a bit too goody two shoes, when actually Hercules of ancient myth was a darker, darker, much more troubled individual. Um, so if they did, Jonathan, come knocking at my door, I would have to say I, did, I would insist on having a slightly darker, more difficult Hercules uh, portrayed in this film rather uh, than just um, the kind of guy we all know and love from Disney's Hercules. But I really hope that they have the muses in there as the gospel singers, um, as the vase painting uh, storytelling narrative, which I think is one of the best examples of film storytelling. Uh, in our generation. Uh, we've also seen the search for Hannibal's elephants continues on uh, the Targus River, um, kind of finding uh, the uh, kind of where the battle between Carthaginians and Carpathians were fought. Uh, we've seen, uh, so Saqqara in Egypt, which if you remember from last year onwards has been providing these amazing finds to do with Egyptian funerary practices, um, now kind of is, is ex they've explored it uh, over the last two years and they're finding shafts filled with tombs um, that are releasing a treasure trove of information about the real business of burial in ancient Egypt. There's a vast funeral industry that's being uncovered here in Saqqara. Uh, and if you remember back to when we did Ancient Invisible Cities Cairo, uh, we actually went to Saqqara. We went to the very first uh, pyramid um, structure and we actually were able to go inside that and then deep down underground um, into the chamber where uh, the pharaoh's body was put, which was pretty, pretty scary stuff. Uh, and then you may also have seen this, and I think this is extraordinary, about how the modern day problems of the city of Rome help us or give us opportunities to uncover new and exciting things because a sinkhole appeared just outside the Pantheon uh, in Rome uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, and as a result, they've had to get in there and do some emergency work to make sure the sinkhole doesn't get any worse and doesn't do anything to the Pantheon itself. And what they've discovered are seven Traventine blocks, which have been found about two and a half metres below today cobblestones which were part of the original paving where the pan when the Pantheon was built by Marcus Agrippa. So the first version of the Pantheon was built by Marcus Agrippa um, back in the late first century BC. Now this has been absolutely superb. Um, kind of, a, I mean obviously it's terrible sinkholes appears but actually sinkholes in Rome are a fairly common occurrence. Uh, when we were filming the very first of the Invisible Cities uh, films about Rome we were working with the specialist team that actually exists to go round Rome and investigate these sinkholes because they were having we filmed now when we, we filmed in the um, I think September time and they had already had in that year 80 sinkholes appear uh, across Rome that they'd had to go and investigate and we were seeing one where some poor private homes garden and their garage had just literally disappeared into the sinkhole and why were these sinkholes appearing it was because of all the ancient Roman quarrying that had been done underground for the travertine the special travertine which was such a crucial part um, and, uh, and well travertine but also the tufa the tufa material which was such a special part of Roman cement uh, it kind of and so there are these massive underground quarries all over Rome which of course have been built over right now uh, in lots of places and all these sinkholes keep appearing so um, kind of the pantheon sinkholes but every crisis is an opportunity that's the crucial thing so there we go we've had uh, sinkholes appearing uh, now what's on very quickly uh, we've got tonight at 7 30 if you can get there live history hit podcast behind the scenes um, it's going to be a history hit podcast with a conversation between Dan Snow and special guest Peter Frankopan it's going to be brilliant tune in if you can and of course classics for all has a new series of GCSE ancient Greek set text that you can read aloud so that's really worth thinking about and teachers out there don't forget that the Warwick Classics Network uh, we are all organizing an event for the 1st of July and it will either be in person or if it can't be in person it will be online where we're going to do a series of seminars from different members of Warwick staff um, about different uh, topics in the GCSE and A-level uh, curricula for class of ancient history etc. So uh, do sign up for that event you can sign up for that live if you have a look at the website warwick.ac.uk forward slash WCN um, and for the 1st of July do get involved. Um, we are running out of time so very very quickly the Chloe Scott you are a brilliant question I wanted to bring this one on um, I can't claim any relationship with Chloe uh, but this is a great question if you were asked to write a new play that reflected ancient Greece for modern audiences or indeed reflected the big issues I was thinking also about the big issues of today if you were trying to respond to the big issues of today in the form of a new play what would your key theme be 
would it be a comedy or a tragedy? Chloe, this is a great question, and I want to put this out there to you on the Facebook page as well, everyone. If you were to write a new play that reflected um, either ancient Greece for modern audiences or indeed what you think are the key issues uh, of today, uh, kind of plague obviously would be one of them, um, and, and pandemic, what would be your key theme? Would it be a comedy or a tragedy? Now, I was thinking about this, and I think one of the things that I see in my role at the university, not just as a lecturer, but also as a personal tutor, looking after students going through their university careers and talking to them when things can occasionally, as they do go off the rails, um, and they feel uh, that they can't cope in one form or another for one reason or another. One of the things that I've been noticing is that there's been a massive imbalance in the last couple of years around where we put our critical doubt. And um, what I mean by that is on the one hand, we've got this huge problem of fake news out there and a real problem that people aren't analysing what's out there in the world around them critically enough. They're not doubting what's out there in the world around them, I think, critically enough. And then in some cases not uh, being given the tools to do so. Uh, so on the one hand, we haven't got enough doubt, right? critical doubt towards the outside world. But on the other hand, what we're also seeing is a massive increase in the amount of self-doubt. We're seeing people not certain and not sure of themselves in all sorts of ways. Uh, and so we've perhaps got too much self-doubt in the world. So my play, if I was to write a play, uh, I think it would, it, could, it would definitely be a tragedy, but it would be about the critical need to balance the right amount of self-doubt with the right amount of critical doubt uh, towards the external world. So kind of, I don't know quite how we'd form that into the characters. It would obviously take place in Thebes, like all good tragedies did, where everything went wrong in Thebes, nothing ever went wrong in Athens. We'd probably have some kind of king involved or queen involved who, who was... Who was uh, not able to rule perhaps because she was too self-doubtful and not critically doubtful enough of her nasty advisors uh, who were trying to advise her of bad things and lead her down the wrong problem of fake news. There we go. There you go, Chloe. A short answer to your question. But send in your thoughts as well, everyone, about what kind of ancient Greek play would you create? What kind of theme would you think uh, is much needed either to explain ancient Greece to the modern world or indeed to respond to um, the key issues and problems of our world. We'll leave you with that. Everyone, what a great session. Thank you so much. There's so much going on. Absolutely brilliant of you. So a couple of reminders. Uh, do get on, involved on the Facebook page suggesting your favourite ancient Greek speeches. And we're going to run a competition about that. Do get involved in the Facebook page telling us about what your ancient Greek play would be like. If you'd like to write a short uh, outline sketch of it and send it in, we can uh, kind of share those as well next time. Um, and also uh, to Karen uh, Bibby's question about if you could take one item home from a museum what would it be finally when are we going to meet next time uh, it's going to be a little bit of time now uh, because of a couple of things I need to do but Tuesday the 19th of May so we're going for Tuesday the 19th of May and uh, by that stage hopefully we will have a, uh, some lifting of some restrictions and be able to go out and enjoy uh, spending a bit of time with small groups perhaps fingers crossed but Tuesday the 19th of May at 4 p.m I will see you there in the meantime stay safe stay well look after yourself